Mimetics. There is there is a class of psychotic mimetic, and usually it will be a PCP type or something like that. In terms of LSD and mescaline, the term usually is hallucinogen, and occasionally we manage to creep psychedelic in our papers, and a few people are starting to do that. So there's been a shift. Um, I don't think anyone believes that they model psychosis in Europe, especially Efrosini Gazoulis and some other and uh, a couple people over there used that as a model because it was politically viable. If you said that mescaline resembled a psychotic state, it was easier to get funding for the research, and they, they knew that, but no one believes it's really a model. Um, in terms of the direction these are going, there's really nobody, I mean, there's still nobody in the field. I mean, when I retire in a couple years, there's nobody that's going doing what I do, um, and I'm not sure why, but um, I think these drugs will be developed. The problem is that all the psychedelics activate two kinds of receptors. One's called a 2A and the other's called a 2C. There's none that's just a pure 2A. And one of the projects that we're taking on now is to try to use our computational modeling to... Yeah, we're trying to get to a 2A select one because 2A receptors are located in areas of the brain that should enhance cognition, improve memory. So we're really trying to move in that direction. The 2C activation functionally has the opposite effect of 2A activation. So we really think that the psychedelics, when they produce confusion and disorientation, that some of it is related to this other receptor. If we could get that out, we may get something that would be, if you will, a pure psychedelic. I don't know if it would be the same class at all, but we're trying to find out what it does if you just stimulate the 2A receptor. So, but there's nobody really focused on this. No one has been aware of the importance of this of this, you know, stimulating these. They're aware of the importance of blocking these receptors as a treatment for schizophrenia, but not stimulating these receptors. But I don't think psychotomimetic really isn't applied to 2A agonist much anymore. Hallucinogen is sort of the neutral term. No, it's neutral, but yeah. Well, the kind of research, uh, I couldn't do it, I don't have an MD degree, but um, the kind of research that Franz Vollenbeiter is doing is really sort of state of the art. He's looking at, he has a 64 channel EEG, he's doing PET scans, functional MRI, and he's using an altered states of consciousness scale. He's correlating activation of brain areas with psychological states, which I think is really the cutting edge where you want to be, understanding how brain, I mean, from a reduction science point of view, understanding how brain changes in chemistry, neurochemistry activation are producing psychological states. Now the thing he's not studying is the so-called peak experience or transcendent experience. I think that's off, that's a, you know, that's in another kind of realm of neurochemistry and nobody can really tell you what's happening there. And that's the most, that's I think the most interesting. What's the neurochemistry of a spiritual experience? When I was a kid, I used to fantasize about writing a book called The Biochemical Basis for Religious Experience. I realize that's not an original idea with me, but it's a very intriguing one. What is it actually when Roland Griffiths gives this to, to these volunteers and they have a mystical experience? What, how, what part of the brain is being activated there? I think that's fundamentally very important, but you're going to tread on a lot of uh, toes of organized religion when you really start defining or trying to say you know, what's in the brain. You're having your religious experiences related to this transmitter change in this part of the brain, but if you're a reductionist scientist, you have to believe that it is. You may not believe it, but that's what you have to say. Yeah, I think you were next. Yeah, he's asking about salvia divinorum. Um, I was called by a reporter when this Salve Divinorum thing first hit and she said, what do you make of all this? And I said, it's like Shakespeare said, much ado about nothing. Um, now many of you may be Salvia uh, aficionados. Um, I personally don't find it a particularly attractive substance. Um, it does activate kappa receptors. Kappa agonists were, were studied years ago as potential uh, analgesics without addictive potential. And every clinical trial they did, they abandoned because they had psychotomimetic effects. So I think that anything that alters consciousness, somebody will use it. And if you use it at a high enough dose, it'll produce severe sensory distortions. I know a guy who smoked a milligram of pure salvinorin A 
went psychotic for a couple of hours, and I don't, in my opinion, was never the same afterward. So I don't, you know, is it, I don't think it's the same as DMT. It certainly doesn't hit the same receptor system. It can produce changes in reality, altered states of consciousness, but I've never seen any indication that it's going to become the next scourge, which is whatever, what the media tries to make a story out of it. So, you know, it stimulates kappa receptors. I'm not interested. It's not something that enhances uh, cognition or consciousness, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, he's asking about drugs out of my lab, Bromo Dragonfly, that, have, that in one instance have killed people. Actually, we made a drug some years ago, methylthioamphetamine, which killed several people. Um, that's very troubling to me. I had discussions with Sasha Shogun about this. He said, look, you publish your science, you, you, know, you publish your results. We had used an assay in rats trained to discriminate MDMA. We put this compound in, and the rats thought we gave them MDMA. Well, if you understand how MDMA works, all they were telling us is that it releases serotonin. It doesn't have the effect MDMA has, because in rats, serotonin terminal releases the thing they recognize. Curiously, this compound MTA also was an inhibitor of monamine oxidase, which is the enzyme that breaks down serotonin. So you take this MTA, and nothing happens. Well, I thought this was supposed to be like MDMA. So you take another tablet, nothing happens. I thought this was supposed to be like MDMA. You take another one. It's releasing serotonin from all these stored pools, but it's also blocking the enzyme that breaks down serotonin. So you have this massive buildup of serotonin. You have a serotonin seizure, serotonin syndrome. You get hyperthermia, you go into seizures, and you die. It was interesting. These tablets were marketed. They were called flatliners. Um, that was profoundly disturbing. Dragonfly, Bromo dragonfly, I don't even know how the names got out of the lab because I never called them that. One of my graduate students gave them that name. They're extremely potent. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if somebody took a large dose of one of those. I mean, this in rats, the Bromo dragonfly is two or three times more potent than LSD in rats. So if somebody took a you know, multi-milligram dose of it, not realizing what it was, I would think it would be very unwise. Yeah, so you can't be in this field making, and you can ask Sasha, you can't make these substances without people making them and trying them. I mean, everybody reads through becomes says, oh, let's try this, let's that, try that. You know, you publish it or you don't publish it. And in science, you have to publish. So it does bother me when, the, when my research leads to accidents or even deaths. It's, it's, it's disturbing. But thanks. That was just wonderful. And I'd like to just make one small comment that with Dave retiring in a few years, as he says, and nobody, you know, in the ranks, this is a challenge to the graduate students in, in the field, in the audience, to, you know, do something that's really going to be valuable, that's really necessary. Um, so speak to Dave. <laughs>